My name is Angela Wall. I'm a certified master gardener with the East Baton Rouge Parish Master Gardener Association. Tonight's presentations and other library series are brought to the public by the Baton Rouge Master Gardeners and the LSU Center, Ag Center. All of us are volunteers who have completed the Master Gardener program and have committed to provide research-based public education about basic gardening topics of interest. Tonight, we will have two presentations, each about 40 minutes in length. After each presentation, there will be a five minute question and answer time to answer chat questions from participants. Then we will be in, uh, able to take a brief five minute pause or break for the before, right before the second presentation. That second presentation is on gardeners made in the shade. Now I would like to introduce your first speaker tonight, Joyce Ryder, a Baton Rouge native who has lived here all her life, except two years as a child who lived in, who had the opportunity to live in England. This may have been the inspiration for the cottage garden that she has created in her backyard. Joyce has been a master gardener since 2015. She is also a fiber artist who also enjoys reading and training for triathlons. This evening, she will share her knowledge and her experience creating a landscape design. She will discuss creating a plan for both a small and large yard. Please welcome Joyce Ryder. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Andrew said, I'm Joyce Ryder. I'm going to be talking to you about uh, creating landscape design. Uh, during this strange year that we've been through, many people have spent more time in their yard uh, gardening, and some of you may have even decided to start a landscaping project. Unfortunately, one of the first things people do is run to the nursery and buy all of the beautiful plants they see and come home and plant them in their yard. Now that might work for a while, but you, there's a good chance you're setting yourself up for uh, failure when you do that. So we're gonna talk tonight about a plan to go through, some steps to follow that will ensure that your landscape uh, plan is successful. Landscape 101. And again, my name is Joyce Ryder, Louisiana Master Gardener. So hopefully tonight, after this presentation, you will have more knowledge about how to create a plan to design and implement a garden space or yard. You will understand the importance of analyzing your space and very important, choosing the plants appropriate for all of your spaces. Some of the reasons that people take on a landscaping project uh, are maybe you're downsizing, moving to a new residence, you've decided to replace your lawn, or sometimes we wanna just break up a large yard into smaller rooms, such as shade garden, a space to entertain, maybe you need a play area for your children, or you're interested in getting making a pollinator garden, or maybe you want to incorporate some vegetable beds. Okay. So it might be that you have a small yard that you want to landscape, such as the example on the right, or maybe you have a very large yard that you don't want to attack all at one time. So you may want to think about dividing it into separate areas of interest. So if you're looking at small yard landscapes, you might want to think about creating a path, having a water feature, or maybe what you want to do is create a cottage garden. These are just some examples of things that you could do. 
In a large yard, as we talked about, you might want to set up what we call a garden room. Maybe you need a play area for your children. You're looking for some vegetable plants, planting area, or maybe you want to create a cut flower garden or garden for pollinators. So how do we do this? So tonight we're gonna to talk about all of these steps. We're gonna start with developing a base plan. So this is like your overall picture of what you wanna do. We're gonna learn how to conduct a site analysis. Think about the needs of your family, locate the areas that you're going to use. We're gonna learn how to create a design for those areas, select plants and establish priorities for your implementation. So we're gonna talk about each one of these. So you can think about your base plan as the big picture. When we think about this, you wanna make sure you identified your property lines. You need to take measurements of the area that you're going to be focusing on. Locate the house on the plan. And then you want to also locate existing features. So you wanna find existing fences, uh, septic tanks, if you have ravines, roof overhangs. And you would want to include on this big picture your compass direction. So that's going to come into play when we talk about plants that are appropriate for an area. So these are just a couple of examples of the big picture. And you can get as much detail as you want, or it just can be very simple. So as you see, the picture on the left shows that these people have drawn in where the power lines are, the sewage, they've located uh, trees and existing utility uh, lines, their utility shed and the fences. And you also see that they have the compass points. And the one on the right is much more simple, basically the dimensions of the yard with the house in position. So remember, this is your big picture. Not a lot of detail on here yet. So one of the most important steps in this process is conducting your site analysis. So you're gonna to want to observe your area over time so that you can record sun and shade. Very important for the step when we get to picking plants for our area. You want to determine if there are any existing favored pathways. Maybe there's a pathway already worn from your driveway up to the garage. Take note of any drainage and wet areas, especially important in Louisiana. You want to view your space from outside and inside and record spots of unwanted noise. Maybe uh, your neighbor's driveway is right next to the, the place you want to landscape. So you'd wanna think about putting up some type of fence or plant wall. And very important, you wanna get your soil tested. So to do this, you would use a soil kit these are available at your local nurseries or at the Burden Center. The kits are free. And there's a $10 fee for every sample that is sent in. So the test results will come back in a report like on the right, and you can call the Ag Center for help in interpreting the results. The reason that this step is important is it's going to give you the pH level of your soil as well as nutrients that are missing. So you're going to be able to put the type of plant that you want for that area and the results will come back and tell you what amendments you need for the soil in order for those plants to thrive. We talked about recording sun and shade. And these are just a couple of examples on how to do that. So on the left, you see this person has decided to draw uh, different 
times of day and shade in where the sun is showing on the landscape. Another thing you might want to do is get your camera or your iPhone and take pictures on the hour throughout the day. So you could, for example, start at eight in the morning and take a picture every hour until four o'clock in the afternoon to show you whether you are talking about a full sun area or partial shade or full shade. Some other site analysis things to consider. Uh, wind patterns, not such an important thing here in Louisiana, but some states it's very important. More important for Louisiana would be your terrain levels or drainage patterns. Find your wet areas, areas that need to be hidden and underground water or power lines. If you're gonna be digging, you can dial 811 and they can come help you with that. So what are we gonna do with this space that we're landscaping? As we mentioned earlier, you might want a vegetable, cut flower garden. Maybe you're looking for a place to lounge or read. You need a recreation area for the kids, or maybe you want to install water features or, or gardens. Maybe you want to attract birds, butterflies, or other wildlife. You want to locate the area that you're going to be landscaping. For example, here is a plot of a yard with the house and the area shown to the right is this area on this plot right here. So this is what this landscaper has decided to concentrate on. You may want to target a small area of a large yard. For example, this quite big yard around this house but they've decided to concentrate on this entryway. So our next step is to design the area that we're gonna landscape. So this drawing is gonna include more details. You're gonna refer back to your site analysis. You're gonna keep your needs and wants in mind and you can work with a professional on this or do this on your own. When you're thinking about the step, you want to think about features such as flooring. That would be your, your ground cover. Your ceiling would be overhanging branches or trees and walls for your outdoor space. That would be fences or hedges. You want to plan for design elements that fit your space and you want to include existing trees and structures in this picture. So here's what some of uh, this design step would look like. So you're going to start actually drawing in where you want plants, where you want hardscape. If you want a path, that needs to be included on your design. Whether it's a small yard or an area of a large yard, large yard that you're targeting. Once we've done all of that, we're ready to decide on plants. So now we know what area we're looking at. We know how much sun we're getting. We know what we're gonna do with the area. We know our uh, soil mo moisture and pH. So now we want to decide on plants. So this is what we need to consider. Light requirements. What soil moisture and pH they need. How big are they gonna get when they're mature? What's the rate of growth? What are the maintenance requirements? How susceptible are they to pests and diseases? And are they appropriate for our hardiness zone, which is 8B to 9A? So these are all questions you can ask the nursery when you go to purchase your plants. So instead of 
running to the nursery, buying all the beautiful plants and coming home and putting them in the ground, we now know what kinds of plants we need for the area that we're getting ready to work on. This is just one example of matching plants to the site conditions. So this mealy grass is planted six feet apart. <laughs> one looks beautiful, the other not so much. So what happened here is the one on the right ended up with enough sun to actually bloom. The one on the left ended up in too much shade. Now, planting a plant that doesn't match your conditions doesn't mean it's gonna die, but you're not gonna get the full effect of the beauty of the plant. And if you're gonna spend the money, you definitely want the plant to look as good as it can. So now we're ready to actually label the plants that we want to plant. So we know what we're gonna do with the area. We know what kind of light we have. We know the drainage. We know what plants are appropriate. We've been to the nursery. We've talked to the, the people at the nursery about appropriate plants. And now we're ready to make the decision about what is gonna go where. So this is when you can come back and label plants on your design before you purchase. So if you're landscaping a small area, these are some trees that would work in a small space. Um, all of this information about appropriate uh, trees and perennials is on a handout that's gonna be emailed to you as well as other information from this presentation. So don't worry about having to write all of these names down. So these are actually some plants that are growing in my small yard. On the left, a sweet bay magnolia. These are um, part of the magnolia family. You don't get the big showy blossoms, but they're a very good size for a small area, grow to be about 20 feet tall. Japanese maple, excellent tree for a small area and also gives you lovely texture from the leaves. Chase tree, Grancy graybeard, and teddy bear magnolia. The Grancy graybeard is actually a native tree to Louisiana and is a good um, substitute for crepe myrtle, which is not a native and really doesn't attract uh, wildlife like the Grancy graybeard does. The teddy bear magnolia is just an example of one of the many small magnolias that are available and you can talk to your people at the nursery about the different varieties. Some trees for larger areas that do well in Louisiana, bald cypress, live oak, and you can see what a large area you would need for a mature live oak. Unfortunately, we see a lot of people planting live oaks in new development in a small yard and they look beautiful for a while, but you can see what problems are gonna be coming up in the future when that gets to be a mature size. Pecan tree is another good choice for Louisiana. Red oak, sycamore, and then the full-blown Southern magnolia, which gets to be really big, unlike its teddy bear. Some perennials that do well. Now remember, perennials are plants that are gonna come back for you. So it's a really good idea to plant perennials in your yard if you're looking for low maintenance. So you're not gonna to have to come back and replace those every year. Agapanthus, the hydrangea, black-eyed Susan, just a couple of examples of many, many perennials that do well in small yards. Ixora, lovely yellow blossoms, plumbago and the variegated flax. Now let's talk just a minute about this plumbago and the flax. These were two plants that I put in my cottage garden, having not asked the right questions, because I found out that the plumbago loves to spread. 
I would even call it invasive. Now, if that's what you want, it's a great plant because it will cover an area within a few years and you get those lovely violet blossoms. I had four plumbago in my yard. I ended up digging up all but one. It was just uh, too much work for me. I had to get my machete and go through and whack it back every year. Same with the variegated flax. It doesn't spread as much as the plumbago, but it will spread. So just keep that in mind. And these are good questions to ask the nursery when you get ready to buy plants. Dwarf beauty berry, dwarf bottle bush, uh, daylily and false indigo. Notice that the beauty berry and bottle bush say dwarf. There is a full size beauty berry and also full size bottle brush. So it's a good idea if you're looking for plants for a small area to ask if there's a dwarf variety of a particular plant that you like and quite often there is. The false indigo on the right is a lovely plant. Now this is another one that's going to spread readily. Again, if that's what you want, that's great. I had to really cut back my false indigo after a few years. If you're looking for uh, shrubbery to make a fence or a wall, these are some good choices. The yopon, pencil holly, and even a uh, sasanqua camellia. So this row of sasanqua camellias is actually what's bordering my yard and my neighbor's driveway. So it blocks that view of the driveway. So we've done all our homework. We know what we're doing. We know what the type of sun we have. We know what our soil is like. We know what plants we wanna plant. We have our design and we're ready to go. Before you plant, these are some tips. Spend time on soil preparation. So you know that in Louisiana, we have lots of heavy clay soil. So you wanna think about what amendments you need, what mulch you need to add to the soil. And of course you've had your soil tested. So you know about the pH and what you need to add. One really important thing uh, that quite often is overlooked is leaving a space between the plantings and your house to allow for home maintenance or plant maintenance. I recommend a three or four foot space between your house and the plants. So this allows you to get in between, clean the windows, paint if you need to, make any uh, uh, adjustments you need to your plants or prune back uh, without being squeezed between your house and the plants. Another really important thing, and this is hard to do, is don't overcrowd your plants at the beginning. So we want that area to look really lush, but it's really better to, for it to look sparse at first and allow for natural spreading and maturation. If you start off with it completely covered, you're gonna find that plants are crowding each other out after a couple of years and you're gonna be doing a lot of digging if you're gonna install an irrigation system, of course, this needs to be done before you start planting. Uh, be cognizant of those invasive plants. Remember, we talked about plants that love to spread and be careful that you don't damage existing trees. So you wouldn't want to come in and pile a lot of dirt or mulch over the roots close to the trunk of existing trees. So how are we going to implement this plan? You certainly want to finish all of your land leveling and your grade changes, correct all your drainage problems. You're going to complete all your permanent hardscapes, such as your patios, walkways, or structures that would need to come first and plant your anchor tree. Now, an anchor tree would be the small trees that you're gonna plant in the landscape. So they need to go in first, and then you would come in and add your perennials and your annuals after that. 
If you're looking for low maintenance and who isn't, here's some tips for doing that. One thing you might want to think about is reducing your amount of lawn area. We don't really think about it, but lawns are quite high maintenance. So they've got to be mowed in the summer every week. They've got to be uh, weeded. They have to be uh, fertilized, watered. So it's really a fairly high maintenance area of your yard. Be sure that you use uh, quality landscape materials, long lasting, you would want to use treated wood or uh, high quality uh, pavers. Select perennial plants over annuals. Remember we said perennial plants are the ones that are going to return every year. It's a good idea to leave some room for annuals so they're just fun to plant, change out, use um, their color to accent your existing landscape. Avoid problems or high maintenance plants. Use weed barrier cloth or deep mulch for weed control. So every spring and every winter, I add about four or five inches of pine straw to my entire landscape. That's just my choice. There's many choices out there, but it really, really does cut down on weeds. Be sure you're putting the right size plant in the right place. If you want to save some time, you can plant in masses. So you can do 15 to 30 plants, all of the same. Really uh, is a, a eye catcher and not just individual plants. And keep your landscape simple. So let's recap what we've talked about. The first thing you're going to do is develop your base plan. This is your big picture. You're going to conduct your site analysis. So this is where we find out where the sun and shade fall where our wet areas are, what our drainage is like. We're going to think about what needs we have, what are the reasons that we're creating this landscape. You're going to locate the area, design your, your plan. This is where you get into more detail. Then you're going to select your plants and place those symbols on your plan and then prioritize for implementation. So these are just some before and after pictures of a successful yard landscape implementation. This is actually my backyard before and after the landscaping. And this was all designed using that process by me with a good result. This is an example of a successful large yard implementation. Now we will have uh, five minutes for uh, questions to be answered, but before we do that, I do want to bring to your attention the 2021 Master Gardener Plant Sale, which is going to be March 27 from eight to two at the LSU Ag Center Botanic Gardens on Essen Lane. To enter, you need to purchase a $10 ticket, which is redeemable for the purchase of plants. In order uh, to meet restrictions for COVID, there will be no holding area as we've had in the past or uh, wagons that will bring the plants to the car. You can bring your own wagon, but you must be able to load your plants into your own vehicle. Oops, can't go back. Okay, um, so that's a little bit covered up there. Sorry about that. But this just says that um, you can purchase your tickets by going to the eventbrite.com website and search for EBR Master Gardener Plant Sale and you'll get that little pop-up that will allow you to purchase uh, tickets.
And if you're interested in becoming a master gardener, there's a contact information for Russell Harris at the LSU Ag Center. Okay, so we'll have five minutes for questions. Let me get back to my Zoom. Turn my camera on, start video. Do I have to? <laughs> <laughs> Let me start the chat here. Okay. Let's see. Oh, somebody says it. Oh, let's see. I can't, is that that's it? it? That's all the yeah. questions? Yeah, yeah, right there. Okay. All right, so it looks like we have two questions. Uh, one is about recommended nurseries or garden centers. Um, so we have several choices in Baton Rouge and they're really all very good. I would think uh, any of the, the ones that we have would carry these shrubs and some will even order uh, for you if you ask. All right, when should you measure the hours of sun? When trees are leafed or bare, it can make a huge difference. So that's an excellent question. Most people don't spend this amount of time when they're doing a landscape, but it's, it really would be a good idea to do it through several seasons, but at least do it in the, the most important season to do it in would be summer because that is when you're gonna have the most intense heat in Louisiana. So if you, if you have an area that doesn't have a lot of shade, it would be very important to know that you have uh, full sun and, and what plants are going to survive in that. Now we know that um, in the winter, if you have trees, it's gonna be sunnier, but you don't have that the problem of the intense heat with, with the sun in the winter. Um, let's see. Enjoy the session. Um, okay, I have more weeds and grass in my yard. Any specific type of grass seeds I should be looking at? Um, the two most common grasses that are grown in Baton Rouge are St. Augustine and Centipede. Again, I would go to my nursery and ask different parts of the city do better with different types of grass. Some areas do much better with St. Augustine and some are better with Centipede. But I would suggest either one, either of those types of grasses for um, our area. The last question here, how many hours of sun a day is it considered full shade, part shade, or full sun? Well, I am certainly hoping that you can stay for our next presentation, which is called Made in the Shade. And Angie is going to answer all of those questions for you and explain what full sun, full shade, part shade, and all of that means. Uh, when can we plant grass seed to fill in bare spots? Um, I am not a grass expert, but I would think any time after the last frost would be a fine time to plant uh, grass seed to fill in bare spots. Will the library have a cuttings class in the future? Uh, I'm assuming that you mean Pruning, let's see, nothing else last I would like to, oh. Um, so Master Gardeners um, is going to have a session on pruning, but I'm not sure about cutting or propagating. Um, where would they find that information about the- announced probably through the- um, it will be announced 
through our public our publicity when it goes out before that presentation. Okay. Yeah. Just check the um, announcements for the Master Gardener speakers. I have moss in shady areas. How best to get rid of this? Oh, I didn't want to <laughs> Again, I hope you're going to be able to stay for our second presentation on shade, uh, made in the shade, and Angie can talk all about what to do with those shady areas. Okay. My husband has killed all the weeds, but now we need grass. Yeah. Well, you have two choices, seed or sod. So, okay. After the last hard freeze, I was waiting for somebody to ask a question about the freeze. <laughs> How, when, and where on damaged plants should pruning be done? For example, should we wait until the plant starts rebudding to know where to cut at the tip of the damaged stem closer to the trunk or just inside where the damage starts? Oh, can you use azaleas and sweet viburnum as an example? You don't want to cut azaleas until they have finished blooming. Yeah, this is this is not a good time, even if there's there's frost damage, uh, to cut back azaleas. You definitely want to let them just go until they have bloomed. Um, after that blooming is over, then you can go back and um, cut. Cut it back wherever you, you want to. Um, sweet viburnum. Not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. That would have to be a question for your local nursery. Okay. Love the library system. Enjoyed the session. I have to get started with planning. <laughs> That's great. Good luck. All right, we're back and we're getting ready to start our second presentation of the evening. This is Made in the Shade. I'd like to introduce our speaker, Angie Wall. Angie is a retired teacher with a love for gardening. She's been a certified master gardener for 10 years, during which time she served on the East Baton Rouge Master Gardener Association Board as committee coordinator, community and school garden committee chair, Chair of the Educational Presentation Committee. As a current member of the Master Gardener Community and School Garden Committee, she continues to serve as a volunteer in the school garden at University Terrace Elementary and participates in efforts to foster school gardens in East Baton Rouge Parish. Her presentation tonight is on shade gardens. All right, good evening. I'm Angie Wall, and I'm happy to be here as a presenter from the Educational Presentation Committee for the East Baton Rouge Master Gardeners. My topic tonight is one that I love because being a redhead like I am and a very fair person, I've spent most of my life in the shade. And that being said, during these COVID times, I hope that some of you do still have some of that shade because as Baton Rougeans know, especially evident after our recent freeze of uh, what below, below everybody's normal of what should be cold, we have had it, haven't we? And I was concerned that maybe some of you may have even lost some of your shade. And if you have lost that shade, there are ways to replace it but you might have to live a lifetime to get another oak tree. So I'm hoping that what we've got left to talk about is how to use the best, we make the best of the shade that we have. So this evening, what we'll be covering has um, really already kind of been discussed by my dear friend Joyce, but I hope that this presentation will provide you with some solutions that will get you into those shade garden challenges in and out of them and noting the daily and seasonal changes that happen with light, and then what to do with soil preparation in the shade, and then also what are the best plant choices for our Baton Rouge areas, which are divided into two because we cut across a hardiness zone, which you probably all know. I happen to live in 8B, 
And uh, some of you in greater Baton Rouge probably live in 9A, but it's not gonna matter because they're so close in that regard that the plants that you'll hear about tonight are going to work in either one of those zones. Back, not up and down. Okay, now we're gonna get it going. All right, if you live in the South, you know that there are some benefits to having the shade in your yard. And we're gonna talk about those benefits and try to work them in. Garden shade is mentally and physically cooling. Right now we could all use that, couldn't we, in terms of expecting what will be the 90 degree temps that are coming. Having just been in a, what, a two week session where we went from 18 degrees to 81, it's like, what? What's mother nature doing here? But when we got to the 81, I was so glad. And then I was like, okay, where's my shade? We'll get to that picture soon. Shade provides a respite from the brutal dog days of the summers in the South, where we feel like we could melt. And shade gives the garden a feeling of enclosure and serenity, which we can all use in these COVID times. So getting going on this, we will need to consider what light concerns there are, just like Joyce said in hers. But she was more concerned about the sun. And by the way, she lives at the back door. I'm concerned about the shade on my side of the street and what shade means in that, in that way of getting the right plants. But as usual, soil preparation is one of the most important things to consider, as well as your moisture and where you're gonna get it and how it's gonna get to the areas you want in the shade. And when we're talking plant selections, even though I have zone 8B, it's really zone 8B, 9A. Uh, so when you think about texture and forms in a landscape for the shade, you want to take something that's going to create interest and draw out from the darkness of the dense shade, which we'll get to. In addition to that, there is water and architectural features that will add to the interest in anyone's created serene setting, which you hope it will end up being. Okay, I still I can't. Uh, no? yeah. what, why is it not doing that? Uh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, just click it. Okay, go. I, that's what I did, but it didn't. But do I have to hit this first? Yeah, just in case. Okay, all right. Here we go. If this is what it looked like, this is what we're which is what we're going for in a shade area. If you really want to go all the way, because we've got dense, dense shade. Wait, I think we skipped something, but maybe not. We've got dense shade here happening. We've got some light coming through over here. We've got some plants that are providing more shade on this side. We've got plants that give you this greenery and we've got a water feature. So if you've got this serene, peaceful setting in the shade, that arbor over here is helping to create additional shade. You've got the plants going and the cooling features. That's kind of a dream place for me. But all shade is not created equal. There is this sense that we have to know what our shade conditions are. So let's look at what the possibilities are. There's dense full shade, which will give you less than two hours of direct sun per day. Now think about that. That's like in the shade all day long. There's dense shade because here we've got that branched out tree with low branches or we're on the north side of a building or a wall and the site in dense shade gets little or no direct sun each day. We know less than two hours. Here's an example of it. And what's the best thing underneath that tree that gets nothing more, of, you know, less than two hours. The best thing's gonna be natural mulch. And that's from the tree's leaves falling off. And it's creating a, a space around it without encroaching upon the trunk of the tree. Because we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. You never wanna mulch up there. But this mulch, makes the best 
setting for this dense shade because it's thick and it's composted. But when you're talking about the mulch, do not pile it up too near the tree trunk. No, no, no to a mulch volcano. Keep mulch several inches away from the trunk. Consider a more natural look, like the shredded leaves under oaks or pine needles under conifers. And if you're gonna use hardwood mulch, purchase the highest quality you can afford because you want it to be free of pests and that it has been aged but has not broken down too much because it will give you some good cover there. And now there's an example of medium shade. Remember medium shade gets you about two hours of sun a day. That's about all. And if you look carefully here, the sun rays are blocked from the area most of the day by tree branches that are higher. Please notice up here, tree branches are higher and less dense. So yeah, two hours of sun are gonna get to come down on anything that's growing in that area. But we're gonna see this scene again with that wisteria and that arbor when we talk about features in architectural way and plants creating shade for you. Now, I'd want to go sit here. I don't know about you, but um, that sound, looks like a nice little place to get away from everybody in the world and just take it easy in the shade. And then there's light and partial shade, light slash partial shade. That partial shade here may be dappled under a thin canopy. You can see it here. A thin canopy of trees with filtered sun, it can also be beneath a trellis, perhaps, or a low light that strikes early in the morning or late afternoon under shady cover. Light shade is ideal, as in this picture, for growing a variety of garden plants because the ones that love the sun are going to get some of that. And the sun, the ones that like the shade on this wall are going to get the shade. And you've got a lot going on, but look at the colors and how it brings your eye into this dappled shaded area. As trees, however, and shrubs mature, we know that there will be some uh, change in the degree of shade over time. And the landscape that will receive the greater shade will then become another issue for what we can plant there. We're gonna look at change over time now. And this is light change in the way of um, what's happening in the, in, during the daytime here. This happens to be the front of my house on uh, two ends of it, okay? And I want you to look closely because uh, I know you see lots of agapanthus in Baton Rouge, but I want you to know that up against the deep shade of my and dense shade up here by near my house, those agapanthus go nuts in underneath the, the canopy of my crepe myrtles. I had one year where I had 70 of them blooming at the same time. You also see them out in the sun. So you, this is gonna make a difference here as you realize what my light conditions and sun conditions are, but we're about really what's my shade conditions. If you look here, my house faces the south. And as you can see, this appears to be an afternoon landscape where in the right picture here, the east morning sun is completely gone. All right, and I have now full shade under the canopy of that crepe myrtle on the east side of my house. But I've got dense shade up by the house. I've got shade, a medium shade here along where the Shishi Gashiras are and the Loripetalum. And then I've got light and partial shade that has turned to dapple shade at the bottom under the fringe, here's the fringe, the front fringe of my canopy on my crepe myrtles. But this is the same time of day and look at the west side of my house. The west side of the house still has some dappled light here, a little bit of sun still shining here. We've got uh, some medium shade still happening here where the shishis are. The lower petalum is still in full sun on the west side. The sedum is loving it because it gets some shade pretty soon. And then looking in underneath the crepe myrtles, 
we've got medium shade and up against the house, some more dense shade. Plant selection here is determined by the light conditions in this setting. But then we have to look beyond the daily changes and look at the seasonal light changes. This is an example of light changes in May of 2020 during the pandemic. The east side of the house, here we are again, has dappled light, partial shade near the front fringe of that, those crepe myrtles. And by the way, those are Natchez. They just hadn't come out in their white blooms yet at that point in May. Uh, with that, the west side of the house has some full sun, some partial shade, and some medium shade. And that being said, um, where it's got all of that, notice the areas of dense shade and medium shade still back here with everything still growing pretty good there. Now, plant selections for these conditions include the following. I have Shishiga shearers here, which you can't see because they're in the medium shade. They're also on this side of the house and also all along the back side close to the house, okay? Then, close to the front where I do get some light, some sunlight, probably only about maybe that four hours a day is about all they're gonna get, but it's enough for the drift roses, enough for the little limelight shrub, enough for the, you really can't see it very well, but I do have um, a kaleidoscope abelia. But here's what's going on. You know, even in the same front, I've got light issues and now I've got seasonal issues, but look at these bubblegum petunias, O-M-G. They were gorgeous in May, but then look, this is the east side doing better than the west side. So there's still a little conflict going on, but in 8B, I guess I'm doing okay and I'm happy. I was happy until the freeze. And so seasonal change, here we go from May, bam, to February a week ago. This is full sun now in my front yard. But what the good news is, is that the crepe myrtles are going to come flush again. And by summer, I will have a full landscape again. But the good news, look at the good news. I had really good plant selections here, people. Okay, you don't see the blooms on my um, bubble gum and you don't see the blooms on my, the pink blooms that were on my loripetalum before the freeze, but they're gonna come back. And look, I still got green, petunias ready to pop again with some color, actually on both sides. But again, better on the east side than on the west side. Now, if you're looking closely too, um, there are some agapanthus that this was the day before they really, really, really felt the cold, cold. And when I say cold, cold, the very next day, all that you see green here was agapanthus leaves and they were gone in two days. And my husband almost broke his back or at least he's, he's really still complaining about it because it took so long to cut all of those back to get them going again. But there's our seasonal light patterns and yet the plant selection has provided them to continue to grow. Now back to the shade. When we want to increase light because our shady area has gotten too much shade and the plants underneath it probably could use a little bit of light here, then what you're going to do to increase that is selectively prune your tree and raise up the canopy a little bit. If it's um, pruning it at the lower limbs on larger trees to increase the circulation and the light. Uh, all right, got those light conditions down. The single most important aspect of working with that shade setting is to consider, as Joyce had mentioned, your soil preparation. 
But in the case of shade, what you're really looking for is how much organic matter can you have in those densely shaded areas? And what kind of fertilizer are you going to need based on the nutrients that are provided in that organic matter? And how much moisture is it going to need if I have really mature trees? Well, that's a biggie because you've either got to have the uh, faucet close by or a long hose to get to it, or you might have to consider micro irrigation. But let's go back and talk about what that means in the way of uh, soil composition. When you're looking at the opportunity to have the best soil for your plants and, or, uh, and also for the tree that's already in existence is to make sure that the site really has at least those two to three inches of composted material. Now, think of the forest floor. You want that woodland area to show in, in any of the soil com composition that you're gonna have for a shade area. It could be as simple as the composted leaves that fall upon it. Um, organic matter can be finished compost, pine bark mulch, if you so choose, manure, old sawdust, leaf mold. It can even be composted grass clippings to add to and compost that setting because a simple soil test will determine what your nutrients are lacking or what they already have, as Joyce mentioned. And it'll also tell you in terms of, well, when you decide on the plant selection, what kind of fertilizer they will need. But if you have good nutrients there, you might not need as much as you thought, but you may not know if you haven't amended that soil in a long time or are starting a new bed. So following Joyce's directions, it applies for shade gardens as well. Now with moisture, as I said, this kind of situation where you have plants growing in shade, usually those plants are competing for moisture with the roots of those shade trees. And so when that happens, this kind of situation is called dry shade. And it calls for drought tolerant plants. You're gonna see a lot of those when we get to plant selection. The challenge is to keep the plants moist during those dry periods, but well drained. Also, you should be aware that shade often gets the blame for growing problems when really it's the lack of moisture. So be thinking about your conditions for moisture if you're thinking about creating um, a shade bed. And as we move along, we're gonna be talking about the plant selections for 8B and 9A and those plant forms and textures that will in, you know, give interest to the area with um, the addition of perhaps some variegated color differences and those architectural and water features. Starting out with fatsia in a shaded area. The glossy leaves of a fatsia will make a big show when everything else around it is green. This happens to be under a magnolia tree, by the way, but that fatsia is shouting, look at me. We probably have a little azalea here that hasn't bloomed yet and some fern off to the side, but wait till you see the backside of this tree. Textured combinations can create interest. There's holly fern, there's aspidistra aleator, and with combined with all of that, uh, get this please into the brain. We're competing with the roots of that big magnolia here, but guess what? Every one of the plants in this picture, even though it's all green, is soothing and guess what? Drought tolerant. You might not have to worry about those water combination, uh, well, problems that might crop up. In addition to that, here we go. We've got another configuration here, combination, if you will, that includes more than plant material. Here we see several plants, including the calathea here at the front. And please notice the nice, interesting patterns on it, kind of creating interest in a shade area, along with looks like to be some uh, sword fern back here. But the additional interests are the stones that have been added to create a walkway. Oops, looking like we're going back into a little more shade area here. And don't forget that elephant ear. 
Um, these are common plants and look at them. Okay, again, a lot of green. I promise you we're gonna get to color. It's coming. This one is the cedar fern. It's illustrating a nice pleasant mix uh, with it's nestling between the rocks that are creating an interest here in this shade garden and overflowing into uh, a nearby planted area. In addition to that, we get the advantage of the lirio over here in the corner with a little bit of purple. So look at what a little bit of color can do in a green shaded landscape. And here we're talking some pretty deep shade, dense and maybe just dense to shade, medium shade. Now we're gonna add some variegation and we're going to raise a canopy. So we're getting a little more light going on here. This is a lace cap hydrangea, look how lovely. And, and it's just interesting with its green and whites, which we haven't seen much of yet, it's all been green. But look at the bloom, the bloom on it is also variegated and that lavender along with what looks to be probably an agapanthus leaf pattern here, You've got a little more interest happening, but get again, there's a lot of mulch going on. So you can see in the shade areas how important mulch is just as much as it is to maintain moisture in the sunny area. And now we go to another green, but the reason this one's in here is to show you what one pop of color can do if all you've got going is shade for you. And that being said, that's probably um, a sweet potato vine in a big pot that somebody decided to move because what did it do for that area though? It, it opened it up to color. That yellow green brightens and it draws your eye in to what is an unusually um, kind of messy but woodland area looking green shade area. Now we're really going to add some highlights to a dense area. And this variegated Farfusium ligularia argentea, say that five times people, okay? But it's one of the prettiest of the ligularia, which by the way, have become a substitute for people who are tired of hostas. We will show you, oh yeah, you'll get to see more ligularia because it covers, it's like a ground cover as well. And in that regard, it um, can cover a, a good space around uh, in a shaded area but I'm not showing you the shade behind, but just know in this case um, with the dimensions here, it would otherwise be a very dull, but with that ligularia there, it pops out. Next, we're gonna look at that plumbago that Joyce was talking about that can get out of control, but look how good it looks here, all out of control. <laughs> it's adding some more to the shaded wall. It's a part, and now of the architectural structure of the water fountain and the flowing water that gives movement in this scene, along with another texture, because we're still talking texture too, with this palmetto and more shade on the top here. So we've got a lot going on here, but please look what a serene setting this would be for anyone needing some quiet and calm. Now we're gonna talk about a little bit of um, tips on adding a structure. This is kind of doing a double surface here. We've got a lattice creating a screen um, that also provides shade on this side, a little additional shade. And then we have an arbor with the arbor giving a little bit of shade. And then you put wisteria on top of that and you've got a full fledged shade area happening in a yard. Even if you didn't have all those trees behind it, you would still have a place to shelter in the shade with just this arbor. So I want you to see how you can use your plant materials as well as your architectural structures. When you do that arbor though, be sure it's treated wood. My neighbor had one and she had wood bees or whatever you call those bees chewing at it a lot of the time. And as a result, it got a little deteriorated, but it has been replaced because we love the wisteria there. I get the advantage of the scent of those blooms and she gets the shade. Look at the other side of that trellis. It's got aspidistra. We've seen all of these. It's got holly fern 
and it's got all those green things going for it. But the people here must have loved it because they've planted it in many areas in this yard. And at the same time, it's still that soothing green. We're going to get to some color, I promise. Now, I had to I had to put this in because it's not a bridge over troubled water. It's kind of the, the bridge taking uh, someone from this shaded area over into another shaded area. Uh, as a as a structure, so you know, just you know, if you have a ditch maybe, or you know, a little stream maybe, <laughs> um, a dry stream bed, it just kind of doesn't it make it look like I just want to go there. I, I thought that was just an interesting structure to have in a shade area. Enough to share with you. And here's that setting again, okay? Because here's the full scope of it. You've got all the greenery around you. You've got the tree. You've got the deck. You've got the table, the chairs to sit. You've got palms here creating more shade for you. You've got understory trees, under big trees. You're lucky because that shade looks like it's been there for quite some time, hasn't it? But we can create our own shade. Just remember that. We can definitely do that. And now we're going to talk about selecting plants for the shade in the Baton Rouge zone 8B9A. And I, I want to mention that I actually looked into that because I felt like it was important to know why why we even care about the the freeze zone. We do we definitely care about it this year because plant hardiness zones are determined by the average minimum cold killing temperature. I did not say chilling. I said killing temperature, which can be found in an area. And that would determine what you can plant that won't die in a freeze. Well, guess what? Here's the range for 8B, okay? 8B's freeze temperature killing zone is from, do, 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 okay. 15 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. People, we were 18 degrees Fahrenheit, okay, in 8B, what, what, two weeks ago? Has it been that long? And compare that with zone 9A. It's not that much different. The extreme, I'm gonna freeze and kill your plants temperatures are 20 to 25. So I guess if you're in Baton Rouge proper in 9A, the only thing you need to worry about is what's going to die below 20 degrees. And that's the only real difference there, I think, of concern. I consulted two sources on this just to be sure. And I was assured, Angie, there's not that much difference. And between the, all the, the drastic climate changes we've been having in this area, I would say if you're in 8B or 9A, you are A-OK. -okay. So I want to assure you that the plants that we have here are going to do fine. Now, here's where we're going with the plants, okay? When we're looking at plants, we're gonna start with ground cover and move on up. Easiest one is what we talked about, that compost and organic matter and those leaves falling. Or you could go back to the 70s, 80s, and 90s to Asian jasmine, as you see in this picture. And some people still like that. But as a disclaimer here, don't ever, ever put that ivy that Asian jasmine rather, that close to the trunk of a tree. Because if you got somebody who's the gardener in your family who loves weed whacking, they're gonna damage that tree every time they try to get that close to train that jasmine. So if you're gonna use your jasmine, use it somewhere else or keep it away from the trunk of that tree. But yes, it's still considered a ground cover in the shade. Oh, but you can go beyond that well beyond that with lesser known ground cover. This is the viola hedra and the lemon balm. They both are vibrantly green in a way that will show in dense shade or in the medium shade as we talked about. And they don't mind the deep shade and it gives you a lot more color combinations to get some distinction there. Now, if it's a good mulch area and it's maintained, you can consider some ground cover that will not be evergreen. These snow poppies are a lovely splash in this mulched area and the blooms will surprise you. 
However, it's been combined with some um, English ivy and look how nice it looks. Next, somebody might say, Angie, this is a weed. I say, no, I love strawberry begonias. Okay, those begonias have those little delicate white flowers. And look at the mulch there and look at the sword fern here and look at that. Oh, somebody dropped a limb and left it there to become part of the compost. Good choices. All right, when you're looking at that, you're looking at a brightness added to the shade. There could be a whole presentation on ferns, but I'm going to only cover my two favorites because they're a little different and they do wonderful things as a ground cover. They kind of take you up from the low ground cover a little bit up and look at this shield fern. It's a southern shield fern used as a ground cover. With this, keep that yellow green color in mind, but more than that, it masses well as a ground cover and it brightens up an otherwise a really, really dark portion of your shade garden. Under tree here is the sword fern. Everybody has had probably had one at one point in time. Okay, but look at them as a clump and how upright and graceful they can be under the canopy of a tree, and they are perfect for the shade in our Gulf South region. So keep that in mind and don't forget about them. You probably have a pot you got, and once you put it out there under the shady tree, I promise you it'll take off. Next, yes, everybody knows a begonia. Well, the hardy begonia adds a nice touch because it has glossy leaves and pink flowers that can nestle into any shady spot and they're easy to propagate. I, Joyce talked about the false indigo. Uh, we're moving up a little into uh, maybe this getting about, oh, maybe three feet tall and combined with this giant liriope that You'll get this in the spring and the summer with blooms. And in the winter, when it loses all of its leaves, you'll still have the green of the giant lirio. It's a nice combination. I want you to visit Burden soon when the gingers are in bloom because the next choice under the shade is going to be gingers. This is a peacock ginger surrounded by periwinkle, pink periwinkle. O-M-G is a moment because this is light shade environment because this happens to be one of the choices that was there before the pandemic. Um, in the shaded area under pine trees by the parking lot near the Burden Conference Center. So you might wanna try to go there and check them out because there they are. But here's another one, and she's a beauty. It's called the White Dancing Lady Ginger. And I don't know, it just, wow. It's another wow moment in shade. These gingers just make a statement, and this one can get three feet tall under a shady canopy. So with that white bloom, um, it just is spectacular. Now, the next slide is something everybody's probably seen, but maybe not to this degree. Hostas have been a shade standby for years and years and years, and they keep coming back. But using this variety under a tree can make you smile. I mean, look, people, we got blue ones now. We got green and uh, pink edged ones, along with the whites and greens you probably have seen. And then in the back, this is just not the normal green. These are larger, and they rise above the ground of their ground cover, but they, they're not flat on the ground. They're actually um, underneath this tree whose canopy has been pruned up. And it makes a statement, does it ever? I mean, to me, it was like, wow. Okay, next is the ligularia, I promised you, that can replace hosta. Hosta can melt in our 90 degree temperatures, but ligularia will not. And look how glossy it is and bright and green, but it's a different green, isn't it? And it's got mulch and it's got some little flowers blooming over here. It's got some things going on and the sun, it can take some sun, but it does do very well in the shade. 
The next Ligularia, and I like it, is a spotted leopard, also a substitute for hostas. But uh-oh, the hostas got jealous, and they said, oh, no, buddy, we're going in that bed with you. And look at them. They're kind of puny next to that spotted leopard, aren't they? So if you want to make a statement again, these have little kind of polka dots of yellow, and it just adds another dimension. You've got several things going on here, the stones, the log, the mulch, the ligularia. Okay, here we go. Angie's favorite. Well, I have a lot. I have a many of them, so, you know, bear with me. This is the Piper Oritum. It is a root beer plant. If you never had one as a child in somebody's yard who loved you, oh my God. Okay, school gardens, that's my favorite. We have some, we have one, it's been there for years. It dies back, it comes back, it dies back, it comes back. It's right where the kids walk and they know, they know it smells like root beer. And that's the wonder of it. Uh, the pistol on it is another interesting feature and it does grow to be a shrub shape. So we've gone a little higher up off the ground with our shade plants. And again, I know it's green, but look, it's a lively green and it's underneath a shade area and it's doing great. And my husband thought it was a weed. I almost weed whacked him when he tried to kill it, but it's still there and it did die back with the freeze, but it's coming. I know it's coming back. And at a Wahoo, I found a Wahoo and I hope you find one too, because I had never heard of this one, but look what it does in a shaded area. Oh, oh, and do I see some more hostas here? Yes, I do. Those red berries are, the, the birds will love them, but look at what they do in that area. Oh, they bring it to alive with all the green behind it and in the shade. So I would say if you can find an Oahu, it's an airy shrub and it has bright red strawberries and it will have those berries until the late summer. I'm almost there. Okay, moving along. You got to go to LSU football games again. You got to. And when you do and you get the chance, go to the, please, go to the quad where it's very shady and you will see the most beautiful French mulberry or American beauty berries with the clusters of white or purple berries. They were fabulous in 2019 and I can't wait to see them again, maybe this season. The oak leaf hydrangea, the queen of the shade garden. Does it look good under story? Absolutely, look at it underneath this tree. It has a white bloom that will turn to pink, then rose, and then dry to a parchment texture. And then you'll be able to use it in an arrangement in your house, maybe. Colias will always add bright color with as many varieties of colias as there are, uh, combined with that lirio behind it in a shady area, makes a statement. This one with caladiums, periwinkle, and dwarf hydrangea. Can you beat that combination? Look at it. And in a shade area, it will just make it come alive. It does so much to add interest. We talked about the phlox. Well, we talked about the fact that maybe native plants like phlox can take off like crazy in a woodland setting mostly, but maybe in your own yard. You can see here, it's understory. We've got azaleas happening in the back and we've got the flax looking like a shrub in the front with gorgeous blooms. Louisiana phlox, everybody's mama had a shrimp plant. Mine did too. She loved these salmon ones. And they are needed in your garden if you're gonna have shade because guess what? They are one of the most drought tolerant of ever a plant could be. They're bug flea, uh, bug flea, I'm sorry, bug free. Butterflies love it and it's a friend in the shade. Everybody knows azaleas in Louisiana. This one is a native. There are every kind and kinds that bloom all year long. But when you have a native one, you're going to have those vibrant ones um, are combined with a dis aspidistra here and yellow. It just makes an Easter saying, doesn't it? And guess what? Mine are trying to bloom, what, how many days after the freeze? I'm not going to prune them yet, as we noted before. Wait until they have fully bloomed. 
If you can't have a dogwood, you can have a mock orange, an old garden shrub. And with its tree-like shape here, it's a spindly trunk by all means, but the blooms are spectacular and brighten the shade garden. Uh, our wisteria is back again only for one reason, to show you that when it's got those purpley blooms, if it's the only thing happening, they do fade into the, the greenery and you're better off with something that just does a little more vibrant color if it's lower in a setting with the shade. But when it's high up, you can see them. The last of the trees, uh, no, it's not. This is the second to last understory tree. It's called the parsley hawthorn. All right, with regard to the parsley hawthorn, it is one of those trees that makes a great understory shade tree. It's as good as a dogwood in our woodlands. And when you're thinking about it, importantly, as a something for the birds, the birds eat the, the berries, the hummers, and the butterflies love the nectar of the blooms. And the last of them that I'm showing you tonight as an understory shade tree, under other shade trees, is the silver bell tree. It does two things for you in that garden of the shade. It offers white blossoms in the spring and golden leaves that will leaves from green that turn to gold in the fall, making it actually look like fall in Louisiana. You have heard about light concerns, soil preparation, plant textures and forms, water features, architectural features tonight to create your own shade or to make the best of the shade that you have. And I hope that you'll take tonight's suggestions and use the handout that will be available to you because everything that has been in a slide tonight is in a bold print in your handout. And with the, that bold print in your handout, you're going to uh, be able to also see many other choices that I could not mention in tonight's presentation. So here's my hope that you can make your own shady oasis. But remember, please find some time to relax and get away from it all in your special garden made in the shade. I know that we've mentioned Mr. Harris before, our extension agent, but I want to let you know that in regard to um, his hopes of having a new class, those will be mentioned by contacting the um, Master Gardener Office, the East Baton Rouge Extension, not the Master Gardener Office, the Extension Office. I'll leave that up for a moment so you can get that information and I'll be happy to take your questions now. And these are the questions. All right. Do all ferns spread? Yes, they do beneath, beneath the ground, but they have to get well established. And so I would say to you that if you had, um, oh, Okay, if, if you had the opportunity to uh, get one of those in a basket that you can get and hang, you know those, the ones that you can hang, well, you can take that apart and break it into clumps. And when you break it into clumps, you can then spread it out and get some things started. I have done that before. Sometimes I use them as baskets when I get tired of them is that I'll break them up and I'll use them as fern in my shade areas. That was a good question. Um, we have an above ground pool that we are taking down. How do we prepare the soil and plant a garden? Where do we even begin? Well, uh, Joyce is with me on this one and we'll probably maybe pipe in, she can pipe in with me. But here's the deal, you're gonna have to till that up pretty good if it's been compacted underneath that, that pool. But what a good idea to do because you almost have your shape going there and if you're not gonna sod it, I think that if you tilled it up really well, really got some good garden soil and really added some um, amendments to it appropriately that you might have a good shot. And if it's in the shade, I mean, I'm not assuming that's in the shade, but if it's in the shade, then you have a whole list of plants that you can use as combinations now. And I hope that helps. I hope I've answered your question. But tilling it up and making it 
really loose soil again is going to be very important because remember, if it's in a near a shade area or it's going to become a shade area, it needs to be well composted soil. I think that would help for you to know that. Is um, ponding for a wait? Huh? Is ponding for a day a problem? How did the how to deal with soil rich in clay. Well, I wouldn't call it rich in clay. I would say get the clay out of there, <laughs> especially for the shade areas I was talking about. But it's a valid question because yes, we all have some of that clay in our soil, but you really kind of have to break it up really well and then amend it with good soil and add some nutrient to it in, in some way that will get it viable again. Um, but I'm not sure if is ponding for a day a problem. I, I'm not sure I understood that question. I'm sorry. Uh, maybe you could repeat it and I could address it again. Will ginger come back after the freeze we had? I have variegated ginger on the west side of my house, but it gets good shade because of my neighbor's brick wall. So last year when it went completely kaput, it did come back. And I would say to you that um, uh, I waited, wait to, don't try to fertilize. You know, if you cut back, don't try to fertilize immediately. You know, let it kind of see what it's gonna do. But um, you can also fertilize um, your it, new growth because it'll not, wait, what do I wanna say? You can fertilize after it gets itself established again. That's what I wanna say. And I have done that because I had that very same thing happen. Um, and they did come back and full flush. In fact, I've got to go clean that bed out tomorrow <laughs> as well. So I'll be doing the same thing you're doing actually. And maybe you want to um, reach me later. We can see how we're doing. Um, is moss, not Spanish moss, a problem? Hmm. In my lifetime in the South, I have never known mosses to be a big concern unless they're on a plant that needs more light and they can hide the light getting into the leaf structure. But moss in the South hanging down, going down Highland Road, I mean, there gets to be a point where you can't worry about it because it's too high up. But I would say this, that um, I used to have it in my crepe myrtles and it bothered me because I needed to be able to see my crepe myrtles blooming. And so my husband and I were always trying to take some of it out, but not all of it because it did look lovely. And I'm not sure whether we should be concerned about other kinds of moss. That answer, I don't know, but I can find out for you. And if you really want that answer, I can get it back to you. So just um, let us know in the chat and I'll try to get back to you via probably an email about that if it's something you're really concerned about. How far should the plants from the tree trunk be? Good question. What you never wanna have to do near the trunk of a tree is prune it and ruin it. That's my kind of combo there. Because if you prune it too close and you hit, the, you keep hitting the trunk of that tree, no matter what the size of it is, you're destroying it a little bit at a time. And, and that does create issues later on, infestation of, of pests. So I would say, oh, okay, what a weed whacker can't touch. <laughs> that, that would be my estimation, but I'm sure there is a good estimation that somebody else more, uh, you know, horticulturally uh, educated on that might be able to say, but I know that's the big concern. It's that you don't want to harm that. And if it's something that climbs, you don't want it climbing on it if it's not something that's going to enhance it. You really don't. So I, I would keep that in mind. And I'd say I'd stay anywhere from 10 to 12 inches away because I don't weed whack, my husband does, but um, I'd say a safe distance. So anything that had to be pruned would not be harmed by what you're using to do that pruning. Uh, future class, will there be a class on vegetable gardening information? I would be pretty doggone sure about that. I have not seen, but guess what? Our meeting uh, for the Master Gardener Education Presentation Committee is going to be on this coming Monday. 
and we should know a full schedule at that point in time of the remaining um, presentations that will be given the rest of this year. And we look like we're going to be perhaps doing more in-person ones, which would be great because I want to see people. I want to connect with people and I want to thank you all for being here. But um, that, that probably will be one of our topics. It is usually uh, something that is covered every year. So um, you would be able to get that information um, when it goes out for publication at the libraries as part of the library series. The libraries would know because you all are, they are, this place is where we like to come. Uh, were there any other questions? No? Okay, then I There's guess. One down here. It's an area that, it's an area that becomes a water puddle for a day of problems. Oh, it's a puddle. Oh, okay. Oh, it's the very last one. It's on your chat screen. Okay, I don't have it open to that. I have this instead. Okay, what just says, is an area that becomes a water puddle for a day a problem? No, if it's there longer, get it out of there. Especially if it doesn't require a lot of water. I mean, it might be in a drought area that you're thankful it's there. You know, it could be in a drought area, but it does say that even in those drought areas, you want to have good moisture, but you also want it well drained. But with the rains that we've had, a day's worth, no, I think you're fine. That's fine. Yes, I would think so. I would think so. Very good questions. Thank you all. And as I close, I would like to say thanks to all of you who participated in tonight's Zoom presentation. Joyce and I hope that you have enjoyed tonight's programs and that you will continue to join us for the 2021 Master Gardener Library Series programs for future in-person presentations as we enter phase three. Hallelujah. Next of the series topics will be presented both live and simulcast on the Facebook Live at the Blue Bonnet Regional Library on March the 18th from 5.30 to 7.30. Due to the limited space, however, you, uh, if you plan to attend the future live presentation on March 18th, you must register on the events calendar for the EBRPL and follow the COVID guidelines when in attendance. On behalf of the Master Gardeners Association, I want to Oh, oh, wait, I forgot to say this. Oh, the topics for the March 18th uh, presentation at Blue Bonnet will be lilies to be or not to be and growing herbs for beginners. So on behalf of the Master Gardener Association, we want to thank the East Baton Rouge Parish Library System for making it possible for the Master Gardener Library Series to resume its presentations in a safe environment in these COVID times. Special thanks go to Jessica McDaniel and Josh Hill for their technical support for Joyce and me to prepare, prepare for our very first Zoom presentations. You guys were our guinea pigs. I hope we did okay. Happy gardening and good night to all.